Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is about productivity and efficiency. It turns out the average person uses 13 different methods to control and manage their time. And according to some studies that were quoted in Harvard Business Review, multitasking is technically impossible and you should probably stop trying to do it. It leads to a 40% drop in productivity, increased stress, and a 10% drop in IQ. And about 20% of the average workday is spent on crucial and important things, and 80% of the workday is spent on things that have little or no value. Ouch. Uh, Tuesday is the most productive day of the week, and drinking alcohol in very small amounts, uh, which, well, it can actually lead to a moderate intoxication level and it can boost creative thinking. However, you won't live longer from using alcohol. I think there are better smart drugs than that. And don't feel bad, nine out of 10 people daydream in meetings. Uh, You gotta do something productive in them. All right, if you like today's episode, the thing to do is to head on over to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. In fact, you can hold off on doing that until the end of the show because today's show is going to be amazing. Uh, Today's guest has written 15 books. He's one of the world's leading management thinkers and consultants, works with Fortune 500 companies to improve their processes, their operations, their quality and performance. And you might say, Dave, this is a show about biohacking and human performance. Why do you have a leading management thinker on the show? And I'll tell you, because if you want to improve your performance, there's probably no better way (laughs) than to pay attention uh, to what this man has to say. And I'm not alone in that because uh, you might have heard of some of his books, but guys like Tony Robbins uh, just endorsed his last book called The Difference and says, if you're looking to create breakthroughs in your business and your life, this book is for you. So this is a guy who's spent an incredible amount of time just being aware and seeing how things work and doing it better. His name is Shubir Chowdhury, and he's most known for writing a book called The Power of Six Sigma. Uh, I was really touched by a book called The Ice Cream Maker, which is a very, you look at this, a very thin book without a wasted word that is, is easy to read, that just tells you about how things actually work in companies, and most of us spend our lives working in companies, not just as CEOs or entrepreneurs, but wherever they are, and I, I was just really blown away. that This is profoundly cool stuff, and we're gonna be talking about that today, so thanks for being on the show today. Oh, thank you, thank you so much for featuring me, finally, you know. Oh, yeah, we've been working, by the way, uh, I, I think I finally found someone with a travel schedule at least as <laughs> right, aggressive yeah. as mine, and so by the time we could line up some time, uh, your, your book's been out for about two months, hit the USA Today bestselling list in, in both India and the US, and is uh, is widely acknowledged. It's your 15th one, for goodness sake. And why did you, what, what, actually, I'll just, for people who aren't familiar with uh, your body of work around Six Sigma and uh, around just improving the way people think about what they're doing at work, how did you get to the point of writing your latest book, The Difference? Like, just kind of walk me through your path here. Okay, um, as you know, and th- first of all, thank you so much for featuring me. I really appreciate it. And uh, as you mentioned, this is my 15th book, The Difference. It uh, came out, I believe, in uh, February of 21st of uh, this year. And, um, and the reason I wrote this book is about, as you mentioned, that I have been doing the process improvement consulting for last uh, 20 years. I've been working with mostly... Fortune 500 companies globally. And um, what happened is, you know, normally by doing the process improvement, what I do is literally make the companies more efficient. And what I mean by that is literally saving billions of dollars. So recently, one of the US automaker, I saved almost $3 billion in 16 months. $3 billion, right? And by it, doing the process improvement, right? And I, I think half of the audience just heard management consultant and their eyes glazed over. You're about the opposite of that. Like, like you are probably the most ass-kicking, most acknowledged expert in the field about going into big companies and making billion-dollar right. changes. So it's, a, it's not a small thing. And it's also worth noting, too, that we got introduced right. from Jay Abraham, who's also been a guest on Bulletproof Radio, who's one of the world's foremost marketing experts <laughs> right, who, right. who connected us and was like, you guys have to talk. So... But but anyway, you're about the opposite of the boring management consulting suit. You go into the CEO level and shake things right. up in a way that's that's remarkable and irrepeatable. So you started out on process improvement, but the difference was actually not about process improvement. What made you change from writing about processes, which is frankly impactful but boring? 
what happened? Hey. So, 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 so what happened was um, after doing it for almost for 15 years, around five years back, I hit a wall. One of my client is getting 10x return. Another of my client is 100x return. So think about this way. Same size companies, similar revenue for the same industry. Uh, so for the sake of discussion, maybe GM and Ford, right? Or maybe Boeing on Airbus, right? Suppose both of them hired me as a consultant and, and I've been working with both of them for GM and Ford for the sake of discussion. They are also using my process. And then one company is getting only 10x return. Another one is getting 100x return. So I was puzzled by that. So initially, my initial reaction was, maybe I'm not a good consultant. Maybe uh, my teachings are flawed. Maybe... Uh, the processes are not correct. So initially, I was kind of blaming myself and my team. And then after a lot of, you know, um, like a research and everything else and discussion with my colleagues and everything, what we felt, saying that, no, if the one process is giving 100x return, maybe we should study these clients. So then what we find out, we are, then we thought that, okay, who is using the process? Maybe the people who are using the process, there might be flaw maybe there. So at the end of the day, what I have done, I have done like completely concentrating on 15 or 20 years on processes rather than the people, right? So the question is that what is the people? Who are the people in one organization? So then we started the companies which are getting 100x return. How is their people? And versus, and when I say people, I'm talking about absolutely on the assembly line worker to all the way to the CEO level. So what I find out is that at the end of the day, if the, one of the company that which is getting the 10x return, they have they don't have the caring mindset. The companies who are into the you know like the 100x return, they are get they what I call it as a majority of the people has a caring mindset. Then the question comes to what is caring mindset? So this book is all about how can I teach an individual at any level in a company, either can be a assembly line worker or a janitor to all the way to the CEO or vice president of engineering, whoever the person is, how can I teach them to develop the caring mindset? Because without the caring mindset, you may not get the best results from the process. So that's what this book is all about. How any one of us can make a difference, uh, either in our organization or in our society or in our community or at your home. You know, that's what this book is all about. Now, Leaders of companies might obviously read this book, but this is written for people who also work at companies. And, and you you really you kind of lay yourself bare in the book about how I've done this, been phenomenally successful, but I hit a wall and like sort of feeling like you failed a little bit and then digging in on that saying, all right, what, what's going on here? And you found out it wasn't the process. It was actually the attitude and the energy yes. of the people in the company that makes a company grow 100x. And that it's not just leadership, yes. it's everyone in the company, which, which means for everyone listening, you have a job, uh, or maybe you don't have a job, but you want a job, or you're working in a, a volunteer organization, it doesn't really matter. Um, your attitude, which is something that you can directly control, something you can directly hack, and something that leaders of companies can also help them influence, um, that that is the biggest variable. It's not about, you know, did you follow a tip and a trick from a billionaire somewhere, uh, although that might be helpful, it's actually, um, did you have the right attitude when you approach the problem, when you approach the day? And if, if you do what I did, people don't know this, I used to put auto parts in boxes for a living. I've welded Toyota truck frames uh, that were shipped to the same plant that today makes Teslas. Uh, mm. They used to make Toyota trucks there, the Numi plant in Fremont. I sure. used to work yes. in Central Valley. Oh, really? So like, I've, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I don't have any burns from that. In fact, I was a crappy welder. You should never drive a Toyota truck that I ever welded on. I'll just tell you that. <laughs> uh, not not my secret sauce, right? So <laughs> in the book, though, you, you discovered this after many years of just like, like kind of grinding on, on the variables to make this efficiency emerge when, okay, you're efficient, but people don't care. It doesn't matter. Yes. What yes. You came up with an acronym called STAR in the right. book that I think listeners would care about. Can you walk us through what STAR is? Yeah. A star is basically that if somebody wants to develop a caring mindset, what are the human attributes that they really need? So a star stands for straightforward, thoughtful, accountable, resolve. Straightforward, thoughtful, accountable, resolve. 
if you really think about it, take a moment and think about it, each of these human attributes, like you yourself as an individual, can, can these four things can be applied at your home or at your community or at your workplace? It can. Question is, it is, you know, some of these are stuffs you have to practice, like each of us, maybe I might be very good in accountable uh, or I might be very good in straightforwardness, but maybe I may not be good in thoughtfulness. Maybe I should demonstrate more thoughtfulness, you know. So each of us have some strength and weaknesses on each of these four attributes. So the book is all about how can, you know, these four elements, if any individual at any level can practice and develop these four elements, they can automatically develop the caring mindset, you know. So now let me a little bit dig into what is that straightforwardness, right? So, right. Uh, and, and the reason, you know, like, which is kind of, you really enjoy that story. In fact, in the book, you might have been already read it. Uh, one day, you know, one of my client, I, I showed up in a client. It was a, uh, in Michigan, the client was in Michigan. It was a very, you know, winter storm going on. And as you know, I thought that I might be delayed because I was stuck in the traffic, right? Because of the winter storm. Finally, I arrived on time because I'm into quality. I always try to Anything I do, try to do it on time, right? So, I, yeah. you know, it's very important. That, that's right? why I, I just have to point out that I kept you waiting for 15 minutes to start this episode. <laughs> and I knew that. And I was like, I feel like such a jerk. <laughs> but I was recording another episode. I couldn't hang up in the middle. So, anyway, apologies. No, 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 no but not that. But the good thing is this, though. What you have done that immediately your assistant also immediately texted me and made sure that you are running 10 minutes late, which is yeah. very good, right? That, that shows yeah. you care. So, they yeah. contacted me you know, on time, say, giving me the heads up, you are finishing the, another interview. And that's great, you know. Awesome. So awesome. I, anyway, so I, I showed up in his room. As soon as I showed up in his room, and he's the vice president of quality of a Fortune 100 company. As soon as I walked in, uh, he was kind of a little bit down. He looked at me and he said, um, Shubir, what would you do after using a used toothpick? So I looked at him, I said, Steve, what's going on? And he said, no, 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 I asked you a question. Can you please answer? I said, what kind of question is that? What do <laughs> I do after using a used toothpick? What should I, what I do with it? And he said, yes. So I kind of, I said, hey, look, before I respond, I tried to talk him out of it. And I said, look, before I respond, I understand that, you know, JD Power report came out. You guys did not do as good in the JD Power report. Is your boss is upset? <laughs> is your boss is upset? Are you having a bad day? Is already the winter stop? He looked at me, he said, Shubir, Forget about everything. I asked you a question, answer the question. And this is a client, so that means he means business. I said, Steve, you really want the answer? He said, yes. So I said, if I use a toothpick, automatically, you know, after using it, I throw it in the dustbin. <laughs> so he looked at me, right. he said, you don't, you don't throw it anywhere in the floor? I said, no. I said, why are you asking this question? He said, Shubir, I asked this question today morning to my uh, secretary, uh, to my, all my direct report, one by one. They thought I was asking a stupid question, but still, I demanded the answer, and everybody said they throw it on the dustbin. Now, here I am, vice president of quality of a Fortune 100 companies, and you are helping me on this quality process improvement. And um, I showed up in the six in the morning, um, and after, in my boss's office, CEO's office, when I'm coming out of the office, irrespective of my meeting is bad or good, I found a used toothpick on the floor. So I said, so. What do you do with it? He said, I picked it up and threw it in the dustbin. But the point is this. Point is, if I can find a toothpick, used toothpick on the floor in front of my CEO's office, that tells me you may find hundreds of toothpicks across the department in any of our department. So do you know what, Shubir? I don't think people care. Yeah. Right? That's the way he has started. He said, that is the reason our JD Power report is bad. Because... And in the meantime, you are helping us on the process. But we, if our people does not care, this process doesn't make any sense. So I said, okay. So he is the one kind of gave me the idea that, you know, about this whole book about this caring bike set. Uh, so, you know, and, and the reason I mentioned this to you, because I kind of feel in America, I think it is not only in just in organization, uh, in a workplace, but also if you go to the churches or or in your community, I think the or even in politics, I think we are not as straightforward anymore. We are not we are not open to each other. We are not honest with each other, right? 
there is a lot of fake culture going on, right? And I'm very mm-hmm. honest with you, because of that, we as a country is giving the price. So think about the company like Volkswagen. Volkswagen, um, you know, it cost them billions of dollars recently uh, because they intentionally, they uh, installed a faulty software intentionally to uh, kind of uh, tell the government because with the mindset that government may not be able to catch them, we are German engineers or whatever, and ultimately they get caught, right? And, right. and it's not only Volkswagen. There's 11 million diesel cars, 11 million diesel cars. They deliberately uh, installed the software to, to show their emission is doing good. Can you imagine that? Intentionally, intentionally. Think about the loss to the environment. They didn't care, right? So yeah. the point is that, but I'm not suggesting every single employee of Volkswagen did something wrong. But the question is that there's a lot of people out there that who are making this type of decision or, or hiding the information under the rug, right? And ultimately that surface. If I, Cornell University uh, did a study, white collar crime in America cost annually $300 billion, billion white collar crime okay so think about the this is not a blue collar i'm talking about white collar crime right so think about the purpose of education right you are a white collar executive and you are doing the crime right and you are graduating from harvard or mit and all this you know it's sad you know and i think that is the part so unless we become straightforward to each other unless we become honest with each other and practice it and a lot of the time People kind of tell me, oh, should be my colleagues. I said, look, look, don't blame on anybody else. Blame in yourself. If there's a problem, I blame to myself first. I try to see, okay, um, what are the things I'm doing, my action, so that my lower level, my next level is not as straightforward with me. Maybe I'm creating fear. Maybe, maybe I'm creating too much of pride. How can I make sure I create a culture? Because if the the reason people don't become as straightforward, two reasons. Number one is the fear. Number two is the pride. A lot of the time, so fear means we, when we go straight to the top on the top of the position of an organization, we kind of create a culture that as if somebody lower level, we forget about our, our past because we don't remember one time point of time in our life, we are in the lower level. So we kind of create that culture of the fear culture. And I'm not suggesting that every company has that, but a lot of company has that fear culture, you know, from the bottom to the top or middle, right? And the other issue is that pride. A lot of the time we as an executive, we feel we have all the answer. I Every day when I wake up, I feel I'm the dumbest guy in the room. You know, I feel that how little I know, you know, how can I, you know, learn something from, you know, even I'm coming over here, I wanted to hear your story so I can learn something from Dave because I heard so many great things about you from um, from Jay, you know? So life is all about the learning thing. It's not that I should not come over here to portray to you, I'm the expert of quality. No, I'm trying to learn still quality. So it, it, I was intrigued when I read the difference because you talk about pride uh, negatively there. And so many people tell their kids they're proud of them, or I mean, there's slogans for companies, you know, where uh, that are based on pride. And yet, you're saying that culturally, pride might not work as well. No, but, how does that work? Yeah, so think about that. There is a two connotation of pride. One pride, what you described, is a positive connotation. The negative connotation, what I'm talking about, I'm talking about. Suppose a lot of the senior level leadership, they feel that if they know, don't know something, they should directly go to your colleague and say, look. I don't know this. Can you please teach me this? Right, right. They don't do that. And so I asked those executives, why you don't do that? Why you pretended you know? If Suppose there's a presentation going on and they are not getting the point. They pretend they are getting the point. And they ask some vague question rather than not pretending it, asking a simple question, hey, I didn't understand it. I don't have that background. Can you a little bit explain to me? Right? So when I'm setting this up, in a Skype, it took me a little bit time. Okay, I'm not a technologically ex- savvy or I'm not a technological expert. So you are trying to help me out. You are talking to your colleague to help it out. So it took us like a couple of minutes to figure this out, right? I don't have any problem to tell you. If you say, should be a dumb guy, you don't know how to use that <laughs> Skype, that's okay with me. That will not hurt my ego because I don't want to yeah. position to you like, oh my God, I have to show it to him that 
I know everything. No, some of these stuffs can happen. Like I send, you know, the other audio stuff you have. It took me some time. It is not working properly. So I, I send a couple of emails. Hey, it's not working. I cannot still connect, right? There's nothing wrong with it because I don't know. I should be straightforward about it. Even if you think I don't know, that's okay, right? That that right. pride I'm talking about. So it, it, it's okay to not know something. And, and something I've worked on at, at Bulletproof is creating a culture where it's okay to fail. Yes. Uh, it, it's yes. not okay to fail the same way twice. Yes. Because that means you weren't paying attention. But like, the first time when you're trying something new yes. or you're pushing your limits, yes. like I, I praise my kids for failing every day. Like if Absolutely. they didn't fail, it wasn't a good day. Right. And, and it's, you know, my employees are very far from my kids. You know, they're, they're my partners and, and they support all that we do. Um, at the same time, if they don't feel safe failing, it, it, it comes down to that ego and pride and fear thing that you're talking about. Now, the other thing what happened is that even in the large corporation, a lot of the time, uh, some of the leaders I find, you know, or some of the managers, just to get the highest position, they do certain thing and, and kind of deceitful or dishonest to the other colleagues to get to the top position, which is not, which is not good. I gave an example of a you know, a, you know, I talk about the story in the story. I talk about a gentleman named Nick and he was an executive. When I met him first time, he was a middle manager level. By the time he passed away, he passed away at the age of 51, 52, right? Suddenly diagnosed with cancer. And now this gentleman, think about this. His whole life, he led his life at any cost, at any cost, he wants to win, Right. So, right. so he took all the credit, all of his colleagues' works, and presented it to his boss and made sure those colleagues doesn't get any of those credits, right? And he had the guy, and he ultimately got to the top position, no doubt about it. He got to the chief purchasing officer or whatever. Suddenly, he got diagnosed with cancer, right, at the age of 51, right? Now, uh, then he invited me, and when he broke the story, privately, that saying that doctor told him he'll only two weeks to live. And he's asking me, he said, Shubir, you need to, you have been mentoring me for so long, blah, blah, blah. Uh, can you teach me how to earn forgiveness? So I said, that's amazing. So I said, what do you mean by that? He said, Shubir, you need to teach me. I have only two weeks left. Can you teach me how to earn forgiveness? I said, forgiveness from who? He said, Shubir, you know, how I earned this chair. You used to come to me. I never listened to you. You used to tell me all the great <laughs> saying that, hey, no, look, you should not be this hurtful to this person. Do you remember this Audrey? She left the job. She now worked for my competition. And that whole particular product was completely done by her. I took all the credit. I got to the top position. And ultimately, Audrey felt that I'm stealing her ideas. And ultimately, she could not do anything. And then she left the company. Now, I cannot die. I cannot die with peacefulness. Can I call him? Call her and to, to, what should I do? Do you think that she'll forgive me? So I said, look, why didn't you call Audrey? So ultimately he called Audrey and Nick and Audrey talk. I don't know what the part, you know, ultimately what the conversation took place. But the bottom line is that I saw Audrey came to his funeral and crying like a baby. The point is, and so what this gentleman did he ultimately survived six months instead of two weeks. But ultimately, last six months, he tried his level best to, you know, to lead a, um, a straightforward life, to lead a honest life. Um, and, and, and there is a gentleman named Randy Posh. He's the author of the book called The Last Lecture. He's a Carnegie Mellon professor, yes. right? Remember? And he yes. said something very profound. It says, it is interesting the secrets you decide to reveal at the end of your life, right? So that means when our days are numbered, we become we tend to become a straightforward, you know? And my argument over here is that this is one life. Try to be honest to each other. That's it, you know? And that is the first element of the star. So whatever we do, let us be honest to each other. Like even in the, um, right now, everything going on in America about the political, um, you know, situation, like with Democrat, and they hate Republicans, Republicans hate Democrats and all this stuff. And everything they talk about bad, like when Obama was president, <laughs> you know, 
uh, Republicans yeah. are talking about how bad he he like Obama is now. Trump is the president. So ultimately, the country is paying the price. Ultimately, country is suffering rather than and a lot of the fakeness coming out of it because our goal is to how to put somebody else down rather than not thinking about you know how we can be honest to each other. You know that's what the straightforwardness is all about. So, so now now people who are listening are getting a sense of why. I think that it's worth their time uh, to read the difference because you tell stories like this that it, you are it can almost bring a tear to your eye. And, and this is a book about corporate leadership yes. uh, and about culture, but the stories are real. And these are from very powerful executives, CEOs of Ford and companies like that. Uh, but this is something that everyone listening can pay attention to, which is if you're holding a grudge or you wronged someone and benefited from it, yes. you think it's not costing you. No, it does cost you. Yes. Every time yes. you you troll someone on the internet, every time you waste your energy hating some person in some political office, I don't even care which party it is, right. that energy, <laughs> like it's coming back exactly. to you. Exactly. Right? Yes, Dave. That, that is so critical. And the... And, uh, then my next point within the star, like a straightforward and the yeah. thoughtful. Thoughtful is all about my goal, even the thoughtful is in my viewpoint is much more like an attentive to the others, considerate to others, unselfish, helpful to others. So um, it's not my intent is not like to, to pretend that I can transform the whole human race or everybody to become like, act like a Mother Teresa. That is not my goal, right? <laughs> that is not my yeah. goal, right? But my goal is that if you, um, when is the last time you go to your colleague and say, and put your hand on their shoulder and say, hey, buddy, you look like you're a little bit down. Hey, can I help you? You look like a little bit down. Normally you are a cheerful guy and today you are down. What's happening, buddy? Is there any way, can I take you for lunch or can I have a coffee? Now what we do when there is an incorporation now, even in, during the lunchtime, we are looking at our iPhone like this. And we are sitting, yeah. having lunch, and iPhone like this, right? Not thinking about that, should we be thoughtful to each other, right? So one of the story I talked about in the book about the thoughtfulness, I was uh, taking a flight from Los Angeles to uh, Detroit. And and obviously, you know, I, I, I feel very lucky. Um, my air travel or the travel expenses always paid by client. And I normally get the first class cabin, you know. Uh, right. And so I, I get into the flight. Um, I was on the, you know, uh, on the aisle seat. And then um, everybody's getting inside the flight. And then, you know, in the first class cabin, they're serving the drinks, right? As you know, they're, they're serving the drinks. Now, there is an older gentleman, like maybe 75, 80 years old gentleman. He took the seat on the first row of the economy uh, right, and he noticed that we have been served drink, so he asked the flight attendant for a glass of water. Said, "Can I get a glass of water?" Flight attendant looked at him and said, "Look, we don't serve any drink um, until the uh, to the economy class passengers until the flight takes off." He looked at it again and said, "Ma'am, I understand. I'm looking for a glass of water. Uh, I'm very thirsty." It took me so long to walk over here. Um, and can I just get a glass of water? She just gave a look saying that I already told you. Now, there is a gentleman, young gentleman, just sitting on another aisle chair in the, in the first class cabin. What he did, he immediately went in and poured a glass of water and then served to that person. Now, the reason I tell that a story is not about that okay, the flight, the steward is not thoughtful and did not serve that. That is one part of the story. Second part of the story, I was blaming myself why I did not become that young man <laughs> who served that glass of water, right? Yeah. So I was blaming myself why in my brain I did not take that up, take that chance and take that a step. And, and I think that is very, very important because in this process, the reason I'm explaining this to you because being thoughtful is a two-step process. First step is listening, okay? I did not listen. I hear what he was saying, but in my brain, I did not adopt it as a listening. Most of the time when you are talking, you are continuously hearing each other, but you are not listening. When we truly listen, that means we are putting ourselves in somebody else's shoes. Then you are listening, right? right? 
So as soon as you are putting yourself somebody else's shoe, that means you are listening to that right. to that person, right? So I did not listen, right? So think about that part. Now this is this incident happened almost two years ago, right? So and you know the recent story about United and all this, right? Dragging the passenger yeah. and all this stuff, right? So you know, and, and that even validated more about my book <laughs> because you know I didn't I didn't even talk about that side of the story. That is even worse. But even thinking about not serving that, do you think that that particular airlines fired that flight attendant if she served that drink of water to a 75 year old? No. But the problem in our society now, we don't care anymore. So every single day when I wake up, every single day when I wake up, I just ask myself only one thing. What is the one thing I can do to another human being? What is the one thing positive I can do to another human being? Think about that way. Think about any of your listener. They think anything. So even so, what happened is that when I do that, a lot of the time I might be driving in the street and suddenly I saw a cops. Right? I just stopped by, introduced myself, and said, "Sir, thank you so much for serving in our community. I really appreciate it." And this guy thought I'm a crazy guy, but <laughs> I still wanted to give my positive energy to this person and sincerely mean it. So you know, every single day, if you think about <laughs> what is the one thing you can do better for another human being, life would be good. You know that. that that reminds me of two things, Shabir. One is when I interviewed Jay Abraham uh, on on Bulletproof Radio, he talked about how when he goes to Japan uh, or yes. or to China, he'll go to the hotel the hotel, go to every floor and meet the maids and and just say thank you, even though they don't even necessarily understand the same language, and that how it it completely gives him energy, yes. but also it, it makes their day as well, just just by being aware and being thoughtful like that. Uh, and the the other thing is I. Uh, when I tuck my kids in at night, I'm like, three things you're grateful for, one thing you failed at, which which I praise greatly, right? And then one thing you won at, and one act of kindness for another person. Like, so they list that every single night. And it's that act of kindness that's a part of our bedtime ritual is I'm working to instill that in them because uh, I, I think it matters, right? Like just, just being aware that you did something. And if they go through this, I didn't do anything nice for another person. When you're seven, you can always find something. Yes. I did the dishes, you know, right. I'm good. But it gets more complex as they grow. And, yes. and I, yes. I, I, I would like to see more of that in our society. And I, I fundamentally believe that if, if you're stressed out and hungry and, and you're eating crap and you're in pollution, it's very hard to be kind to others because you're just too tired. Yes. That, that's part of my mission is, is right. to fix that. Right. So, and that is the thing, like, so when you go to a large organization, you may not find that, you know, a lot of the time yeah. you don't find that thoughtfulness. So if we can really yeah. bring them in, so then you will find, wow. And and the thing is that it is not, you cannot be like point fingering each other rather than you point finger yourself and you say, mm -hmm. look, what can I do? Okay. I don't need somebody else to teach me about thoughtfulness. And it can be very, a small gesture matters, you know, and yeah. that is the whole point, you know. Um, I, after reading the manuscript, one of the executive um, of a Fortune 100 company invited me um, and to discuss about the difference. So I said, okay, so I, I showed up in his office and uh, so I, I asked and he was praising about the book. So I said, hey, hey look, uh, praising about the book will not make me happy. Tell me what is the one or two things you have done by reading the book or you practice or you wanted to discuss with me. He said, Shubir, very honest with you. I I said, out of the four elements I talk about, a straightforward, thoughtful, accountable, and um, the resolve, out of these four, tell me one area you are doing pretty good. I asked him that you are very proud about yourself. So he said, very honest with you, I go to church, you know, every week, and, and I think everybody tells me I'm a very thoughtful guy. So I said, okay, should I take you a test? He said, sure. He said, sure. I said, okay, I'm going to take you a test on thoughtfulness. He said, okay. So I just generally, I said, uh, hey, you know, you work very hard. I know you for a long time. Um, last time when I engaged with you for almost for two years, I didn't see you a single day. You took a vacation. Are you still working hard like that? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I said, did you take a, when is the last time you took a vacation? He said, believe it or not, I finally took a vacation around two weeks ago. I said, okay, tell me about your vacation. So what he did, Dave, 
he talked for 15 minutes non-stop about his vacation, <laughs> right? And so excited and everything else. So after I listened to all this, I said, you know what? Thank you so much for sharing your positive energy with me. And I'm so pleased to know you have a blast in your vacation. So I said, look, you booked me for one hour. Now I ask you a simple question. Hey, what do you do in your vacation? You nonstop talk for 15 minutes about your vacation. Thank you. You gave me some positive energy. But 15 minutes gone. Let me ask you this. What percentage or how many minutes you have spent talking about these vacation stories, your vacation positive energy, you gave it to your direct reports? He looked at me, he said, Shibir, you know our company culture. I said, excuse me? <laughs> I, I, said, I said, excuse me, what do you mean by your company culture? He said, Shibir, we don't talk like that way. I cannot, I'm the executive in this level. You know, I cannot talk to my direct reports about my vacation. I said, why not? So I said, let me ask you another question. I said, if I die today, are you going to fly from La like Detroit to Los Angeles to attend my funeral? He said, I don't think so. If I have a job and I don't have that kind of relation, I wanted to be honest with you. I said, do you know what? I appreciate your honesty. I may not also come to your funeral because if I have another concerning engagement, because we are not that close. But let me ask you this. If you die today, do you think your direct reports will go to your funeral? I asked him. He said, Shubir, I, I, I think so. I said, think about this. Here I am. You shared your positive energy for 15 minutes talking to me and giving your positive energy where you know in your heart I will not even attend your funeral. And the people who work every single day giving their 110% to make you successful yeah. and you are not you are not telling sharing your positive energy or your vacation with them. What is wrong with you? He said, Shubir, then what should I do? I said, you change the system. You belong, you become your own self, the change. So you you change the system. And believe it or not, Dave, last six months, he's trying to do that. You know, continuously trying his level best. You know what I'm saying? I, I do. All right. I'm going to, to blatantly ask you for some free consulting now. <laughs> sure. um, <laughs> Uh, I've been working on on that at Bulletproof as well. And, and one of the things that we do when the senior leadership team gets together on our weekly call, we spend the first few minutes where everyone on the team talks about something they're grateful for. The, the meetings are usually on a Monday or Friday. And it's it's can be, I'm grateful we had you know the best week ever at work, but it's quite often you know, my, my daughter graduated from high school or got married or I, it was sunny this weekend and just went out with the family. And, and we talk about stuff like that. And it, it, it actually changes the tone of the meetings. It, it's really powerful and, and all that. At the same time, sometimes you only have an hour <laughs> and you might spend 15 minutes of the hour uh, with people kind of sharing their gratitude and then you don't get the work done. So how do you balance that out when you have a, a group of people like that? Like the energy is valuable, but getting, you know, getting the meeting done is valuable as well. See, a lot of the time it depends on the situation. So the question yeah. would be, a lot of the time, what you have to do is that depending on your organization, if you're the CEO, you may not have to do it every single day or every single week. But what you do is even when you come out of the, from the vacation or something you did significantly good outside of your work, right? You mm -hmm. coming in and you calling everybody saying that, hey, buddies, I miss you guys for last two weeks. I was in vacation. Or I went to Europe. Come over. I wanted to talk with you, all of you. And then you, you share your story, what you have done that excited you, and, and tell them you genuinely miss them, if you did miss them or your work, <laughs> and you tell them that. If you truly, if it is not, then you don't tell them. You just tell them, do you know what? I had a miserable day at that time over there uh, you know, on this assignment or whatever, and I wanted to share with you guys. I'm already stressed out. I want to be very blunt with you. So what I expect from you guys, I might be screaming with all of you. I might be very rude with you, all of you, don't be pissed off or anything like that because I'm in a bad state of mind, right? I wanted you guys, I still love you guys, but I need to share with you because I had a bad time with that two weeks of mine. So be honest and, and, and I think because you are demonstrating your authenticity yeah, and without any warning, without any formal way, formal, if you do it in a formal way, you may not get that information because what will happen would be when if you put as a system that every time, every day or every week they have to report, what will happen? Oh my God, today we have to go to the meeting and 
these people mm. will be talking about, he'll be going to ask about what I'm grateful for. No, rather than without any preparation, suddenly you ask them or you go for a walk. You know, a lot of the time, what I did in a lot of the very large corporation, I even pushed the senior leadership, pushed them out of their office and told them to go for a walk on their department. <laughs> and they don't know how to react. And I told them, I said, be human. Just go, go there and put your hand to a guy. And he said, Should we, they'll be shaking up. I said, that's okay. If they shake up saying, buddy, why are you shake up? Hey, yeah, 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 I, I'm, I'm this, I'm vice president of this, and you're an engineer, so what, buddy? Let's talk about it. So treat them as a human. See, the, the problem is that, you know, the more, more I feel the CEOs or the chief financial officer, any of the senior leaders, more they can bring their human human perspective to mm -hmm. the workplace, they'll be better. Like Mother Teresa, think about that. She never, even when she went to Nobel Prize ceremony, she was still talking from her heart that she didn't do anything. She didn't she did nothing. She's still in pain because there is still so many people are dying in the street of Calcutta. That is bothering her. You know what I'm saying? So, right. um, so anyway, the next point I wanted to talk with you about the accountable. Uh, the next yeah, let's talk about accountability. Accountability. So accountable is much more like taking a personal responsibility, right? Traditionally, especially in a large company or a small company, when the problem happened, our mentality is, it's not my problem, it's all somebody else's problem, right? Then you come up with your stories, how you can get out of it. Rather than, we never say, hey, this is an organization I'm working for. Even if my colleague is screwed up, do you know what? My paycheck is coming from this company. I think I should go there and I should defend saying, no, 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 problem also belongs to me. Question is that we don't feel that we are um, we are accountable enough. And, and, and I wanted to mention to you a quote Mother Teresa said, amazing quote. She said, do not wait for leaders, do it alone. Do not wait for leaders, do it alone. When Mother Teresa did what she did, we made her saint later, right? After she died, we made mm -hmm. her saint. But she never went to Catholic church or Pope or whatever to ask them, uh, Pope, I wanted to save some life and I wanted then I wanted to be a nun. She didn't say any of that. She just went there and she found some people are dying and she wants to give them the food and try to give them a hand. That's it. One at a time, right? So I think the real question would be any problem you see, if you always feel that you are personally responsible, personally accountable, you can you can make a difference. So let me give you a phenomenal story. In fact, you'd be surprised. She is one of my hero, and she's only 13 year old. 13 year old, a 13 year old Chicago girl. Uh, you know, uh, her name is Trisha Prabhu, Chicago girl, and she might be 16, 17 now. And she, um, one day coming from school, and she found out that a 16, a 11 year old girl in Florida died, committed suicide because of cyberbullying. So she read that. So as soon as Trisha read, a 13-year-old girl read that, another estate, a 11-year-old girl died because of cyberbullying. She basically said, enough is enough. She said, I don't care. That means my parents, it doesn't matter what they say, they cannot help me. Uh, all these adults, she gave up. She said, I have to go to the front line. I'm going to solve the problem. Then what she did, she started research and research and research. Long story short, she came up with, she came up with an app called Rethink. And you can check this out, Rethink, okay? What they did is that what she found out, adolescent brain, if you, when they are trying to do something, instantly, if you put a wall in front of them, 90% of the time they will stop, they will not do it. So rethink what it does. Any, anytime you social media, you are typing something negative, which might be a hurtful message to somebody. If you have a rethink app, rethink app will come to you and say, are you sure you wanted to put this message and it will harm somebody else? Now, do you know what is the result? 93% of the adolescent who use this app decided not to post harmful message. Think about that. That is... That is huge. That is wow. huge, right? 
And now Facebook, Google, and everybody is promoting. Trisha became big hero into this community. She's giving her speeches all over the world. Now think about that. A 13-year-old girl wants to take the personal responsibility in their hand. I'm accountable for it, right? Like if you ask me today, you know, am I optimistic about America, everything going on? I say, absolutely. 110% I'm optimistic. Why? Should be why? Even this, you know, Paris deal didn't go through this, that, everything. Still, I'm optimistic. Because yeah. if you, every single day when you wake up and you think that you can make a difference and you, and if, if there is a problem, I kind of feel that how I can make a difference myself. So I wanted to reach out. Like for an example, right now, one of the things I wanted to, because the current US president, I know him very well. And we did some, we had a business relationship in the past. So, um, so I'm trying to, you know, talk with them. If there's any one particular department in federal department, federal government, I can make a difference for process improvement because you know their process is broken. I passionately believed in it and I wanted to make a difference. You know what I'm saying? So I think personal yeah. accountability always comes to that, that you know, I, I talk about five things. Uh, being the aware of the something needs to be done. That is the number one. Number two is the taking the personal responsibility. Number three would be you have to make a choice or decision to act on it. And number three would be you have to think about very deeply what is the consequences of your action. A lot of the time we come up with something like if I know my message might be hurtful to you, am I pausing and thinking, do you know what? I don't want to offend Dave. This may not be the right thing to do. You know what I'm saying? And we don't take that time. So even suppose you are a different political party, I'm a different political party and we are having a big fight. I should not offend you any way. We should have a different viewpoint, but that doesn't mean that we have to offend each other. You know what I'm saying? But that's what is going on yeah. in society right now. And the fifth thing is that you always, when you take the personal accountability, you always have to set the high expectation. You know? The the idea of being accountable for, for what your words do, it, it it's entirely possible to disagree. I, I see this all the time mm -hmm. in the world of nutrition and, and biohacking, where someone who disagrees with you immediately gets attacked. Uh, and it, it's like, no, we might disagree on, on science, but I've had people on who, who promote you know, whole, whole food veganism and things that, that I know biologically don't work for many people. Sure. But I'm happy to have the conversation to disagree and to be cordial and respectful. Yes. And, yes. Uh, and, and that, uh, that's how science happens. And, and as soon yes. as you get the tribal, the tribal stuff, which is funny because your first thing about being straightforward Right. You can be straightforward in a non-aggressive, non-harmful way yes. and still get things done. Yes. And what you're talking about accountability here, if you're straightforward and you're a total jerk, you didn't do it right. And, you are and absolutely you didn't, right. Yes. You didn't hit it. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, but absolutely. It, it, See, these are kind of interconnected too, you know? Yeah. And that's why when Jay read the book or Tony read the book, they felt every one of those elements is also yeah. kind of dependent on each other. They have a symbiotic relationship, you know? They, they do have a symbiotic relationship. And that's why I think it's a profound book that, that goes far beyond leadership. And that's why it's, it's a bestseller. And also, I, I probably didn't give you the best introduction here because uh, something else that you write about, you're, you're very humble in your writing. And, and you talk about how in 1991, you came to the US to, uh, uh, to attend graduate school. Right. You flew for 56 hours from Bangladesh, which is one of the poorest countries in the world. Right. And you're looking to save money. What happened when you got here? Like, like your star, the reason you know and you are the way you are, it, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing, almost unbelievable story, but it's real. Yeah. So what happened when you landed? Right, uh, that is my story about even resolve, you know, that the last yeah. point of the book. So think yeah. about this. So I came over there and my professor told me that uh, if you come to America, like, a, you know, if you come to the college uh, at least two weeks prior, uh, then you have a very high chance of getting the scholarship uh, because we, we, I wanted to work with you. And then, you know, you don't have to worry about your tuition, nothing. So I said, okay. So I trusted him. I declined all the other schools. I came over there with the professor. As soon as I walked in, I came three weeks early instead of two weeks because I wanted to impress him. I wanted to work for free for three weeks. So um, as soon as I walked into his office, he looked at me and said, hey, you're supposed to come next week. Why you came one week early? So I said, sir, you told me two weeks early. I came three weeks early because I, can, I wanted to work more to, you know, for you so that you might know even get to know me even better and you know not you are not paying me the scholarship will start three weeks from now so he said hey uh, i need to tell you something uh, unfortunately the scholarship is given to somebody else and this is my first day in america first day in america and i am the 
uh, first generation from both my parents' side, the first person came to U.S. in 1991, wow. right? So I don't have any other relatives or nobody. You know, later on, my sister migrated after I came, but nobody. So, and of course, I know some college friends or whatever, they came a little bit before me. But here I am, uh, and I was declined, and uh, like he was saying, so I, I, I cried, I did everything possible to convince the professor that saying that, sir, you cannot do that, I don't have any money. He said, sorry, it will, I'm so sorry, it will not work out. So I came to my room and I kind of felt that, that this is not the th reason I came to America. And I said, you know, maybe um, I have a choice and a lot of the other um, international students, you know, I talked with some Indians and Bangladeshi students, they come to me and they said, we don't worry about it. You can work illegally. You can. I said, nope, I don't want to be illegal. <laughs> you can make some money. I said, nope, I don't want to be illegal. So then what I did, I went in, I kind of meditate myself. I, you know, um, and then I thought, you know, um, I'm going to go after this and myself and resolve this. So I challenged to myself saying that I'm going to resolve it because this is America. Everything I read in the book, everything I see in the television and everything else, this is the American. I said, there is no way so many people in the world talk about American dreams unreal. I said, that is not, it cannot be true. I have to resolve. Maybe it is a test I have to go through. So what I did, I went to every single department, every single department. I think it's like 23 or 24 department I went and trying to convince them what can I do for them. Ultimately, after the 22nd or 23rd department, mathematics department, that chairman, I was humiliated within that process. I went to English department, journalism department, and I had a degree in aerospace engineering when I came, <laughs> right? So I'm trying to convince all of them, and I was rejected, rejected, rejected. Some professor said, are you out of your mind? Just don't waste my time, get lost. You know, like that, right? Went through all this. Ultimately, the, still I didn't give up. Mathematics department chair, he listened to me and he said, wow, you went to 22nd department, 22 department, you badly needed the money. I said, sir, yes, sir. He said, how about this? I'll give you some loan. I said, no, sir. I have to earn on my own. I, I graduated from one of the top schools in India called IIT. I, I need to. Mm -hmm. so, so, so he said, okay, look, I'm going to introduce you to the faculty. There's no guarantee. Right now, there is a fellowship would be given, but they're interviewing a lot of candidates. But it might be too late, but we may still give you a chance. Looks like, you know, let us discuss. So, okay, so long story short is that he introduced me a professor, then the professor, then I went to the interview process for three or four interview process. Ultimately, only one student has to be selected. And I got selected by Dow Chemical. It is the Dow wow. Chemical Fellowship. So Dow paid for my whole master's degree. And, and I was is that where they call it? And is that where they call it an endowment? Yeah, Sorry, yeah, yeah. Like, 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 <laughs> like, <laughs> like it is a, it is a, it is a fellowship on uh, doing the research on polymer. But okay, wow. Polymer, right? As an aerospace engineer, aerospace which is engineer, not even right? your. So you yeah. know what I did after I met with the professor. Once I, I find out what is the topic of the research, from that professor's room, the three days later, I supposed to have an interview with the with the Dow researcher, non-stop for. Two days, I was in the library, continuously yeah. reading and starting self-teaching myself, preparing for the interview on the polymer research on polymer. So ultimately, <laughs> you know, but the point is, not only it helped me, plus that research, that graduate research got the best thesis award from the university when I graduated, right? So, and then one after another came, but the point is that, think about at that moment, you know, even at that time, I was shortage of $200 before the fellowship kicks in, I was shortage of $200. I went to a bank. Bank rejected, rejected, right? Then I tried my level best thing. So I told this manager, looking at her and said, ma'am, she said, do you have a collateral? I said, ma'am, I just landed in America. I don't know anybody. What do you mean by collateral? How about you? You become my collateral. She said, I'm the bank manager. I said, so what? If I'm your brother, do you think that you will not become? And she looked at me. She said, she remembered. So I said, so ma'am, if you ever change your mind, why don't you call me? So I left that. Next, she could not sleep whole night. She remembered because I told her that if I'm your brother, are you going to decline? You will not be my collateral. Why don't you think that I'm not your brother? And she's a white Michigan lady, 
right? American lady, right? And here I am, Latin in America. I, and she's the first person I invited for my graduation ceremony. In fact, uh, the, you know what I'm saying? Is, is, think about that when I graduated, because that $200, in my viewpoint, is much more needed or much more desperate for that than even right now for like $20,000. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, I, I know exactly what you're saying. I, here's a question, though. So I, I run a very high-end executive brain training facility, and uh, your story reminds me a lot of uh, Vishen Lakhiani, uh, who uh, runs Mind Valley, who's uh, the largest online meditation teaching thing. Uh, tens of millions of people look, look at his stuff. He's, he's a friend. And, and I've looked at the brain of other people who have been able to enact change mm -hmm even in, in somewhat desperate circumstances like that. And there are common things in, in those people's brains. They have the ability to just make it happen mm -hmm. uh, in a way that it is nonlinear and non-obvious, but it, it's a predictable brain pattern. And you probably have that. In fact, I, I would bet a substantial sum that if we looked at your brain waves, that I could predict at least a, at least a directional thing there. Maybe, yeah. Do you think, do you think that, the, that, that everyone out there with resolve would get similar results? Was, was it just a resolve or was it that you have no, an innate I, ability to make stuff happen that's, that's unique? That's an excellent question. I, you know, obviously I'm not the scientific researcher, you know, and obviously um, there is a Carol Dweck wrote a book called The Mindset, right? In a Stanford yes. University professor, which kind of inspired yes. me to write the, uh, this difference as well. And Carol said something very profound after the research and doing all this research. What she said is that you can change your mind. You can do yes. it if you have the attitude. So that convinced mm -hmm. me. That convinced me. So, you know, one of the things I always talk about, if you ask me who is my leadership guru or who is the people I admire the most or who taught me on leadership, I'm very honest with you, it was a very tough question because when I was finishing my, my manuscript, uh, after finishing the manuscript, after reading, writing the first five chapters of The Difference, when I sent it to my editor in Random House, after he read it, he, Roger came back to me and said that, Shubir, I love it, everything is great, up to the fifth chapter, but you have to develop another chapter. I said, for what? He said, reader wants to know about your own story. Who taught you this star principle? Can you share yeah. that, right? So I said, that is a good question. She said, he said, you figure it out. I said, oh my God, then I then I went in and trying to figure it out, who is the foundation? And do you know what? There's only three people came out. My father, my mother, and my grandfather. None of the leadership guru, none of the Jack Welch or, or Marshall Goldsmith or Jay, nobody. Why them, right? The reason is that what I felt, some of the, some of the ingredients or some of the games my grandfather played, in fact, in the book I talk about, my grandfather used to give me a coin. When I was five years old, he used to give me a coin and a pen. And he said, Shubir, choose one of the two. And every time I choose the coin, he said, Shubir, never choose coin. Always choose pen. I said, why? I said, I can. He said, because once you uh, choose the coin, you then in whatever the purchase you make after that is done. But in pen, if you choose the pen, it continues to create. He said, your pen, you are writing first grade exam too. You can write all the way out to your graduate program exam. Same pen. Said, so at that time, I didn't understand the details of it. But what he also said, he said, pen also create. So think about this way. Um, if you read a book, it's written by somebody. So what do you do? And you as a reader, if you read the book, if you don't like the book, you write to the author what you didn't like. If you like it, you also tell them what you like. If you dislike, you also tell them what you dislike. So I said, Grandpa, I'm seven year old, I'm eight year old. If I write to them, <laughs> they may not reply to me. He said, Shubir, if they don't reply, write it again. I said, Grandpa, <laughs> you, if, if I write to 100 letters, they don't reply. He said, write 100 first letter. So I said, Grandpa, why you say that? Do, do you really? He said, Shubir, miracle will happen. Always remember any human being is achievable, like reachable. And so what do you do? You start writing. So guess what happened? By the time I was only 12 years old, 12 years old, okay? When I was 12 years old, I was dining with some of the, you know, India's top laureate, some fantastic fiction writing authors. I was dining with some actor and actress, all type of people. 
became my friend, musician, brilliant painter, because what happened? Power of the pen. I used to write to them, right? So now, when I came to America, when I wrote my first book, I used the same my grandfather principle. At that time, I was not a known name in quality. I was 26 years old. My first book came out called The QS 9000 Pioneers. But my determination was every single living quality gurus, Dr. Taguchi, uh, Philip Crosby, J.D. Power, I wanted them to read the manuscript. So I wrote to them. Nobody replied. Wrote to them again. Nobody replied. I wrote them 20, 20 times. They replied. And ultimately, every one of them came to my book launching ceremony. Now, wow. think about that. I was 26 years old. All of the world's top quality giant came. Another thing my grandfather used to say, always remember, if you hang around with the pig, you will smell like a pig. If you hang around with some uh, good people, you'll be smelling like a good people. He used to tell me. So, what? and the power of that was, because of that methods, think about how it came. A um, lot of the people have started thinking, oh my God, all the world's top quality gurus now come in and, and <laughs> launching Shubir's book. Maybe this guy will be the future quality genius. At that time, I was not a quality guru. People are already thinking about it. So by the time I was 30, I was already became a quality guru. It's not that my brain became suddenly, you know, more powerful. Seriously, it is the same principle. So I think the to answer your question, can it be done? I think if you have the perseverance, if you have the passion of what you do, like think about, you can automatically figure it out. This is the first time you're talking that uh, I'm very passionate of what I do, right? Yeah. And everything I've done is based on that passion, you know, and ultimately result came. You know, I never, I always followed the pen and coins followed me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. Right. That's what right. my grandfather taught me. You know, and that's what the, so if you have the determination, I think any human being can do. Question is that, are they, uh, is most of the people take themselves that seriously and go for it? That is the real issue. And when you, when you wrote these letters, you actually wrote letters, not emails. No, no, you no. probably no. hand wrote them. 1991, there's no email. You know what uh, I'm saying? Fair point. Even, even 1998, yeah. there is no email. Like there's, yeah. email is not that popular, right? So even Dr. Taguchi in Japan, and he was like 70 years old, I directly wrote. Now, there's another book I did, um, and at that time, it was no internet was not even invented. It was 1999. There's a book called The Management 21C. Um, I worked with world's top 25 management thinkers around the world, London Business School, Harvard, uh, Sloan School of Management, all the world's top gurus, just to challenge myself and led a group of 26 people, world's top management thinker. That one, a lot of the stuff at that time just email, just invented. And I, I, start, I started email at that time. But you now it's it much easier, you know? Now it's much it, easier. It, it's easier. And I'm finding that there's a bunch of people who use the automated software to do that, you know, the, the sales automation software. Oh, no. And you know what? It's such crap. I, I get those all the time. Yeah. And I actually block those senders Absolutely. the first time because you can always tell. Yep. And, and what you're talking about is you're actually writing to the person. Yes. Uh, and and there's nothing like the power of a handwritten letter. Even My, today, Dave, even right now, I yeah. still take the time and I write some private handwritten letter to some of the top executives. Private, right? If I read yeah. something in the Wall Street Journal and I still took the time rather than sending an email, and they take it so seriously because it's so out of the box, you know, it matters. I, I met a guy, an incredibly powerful TV guy. He, he knows who he is, but I don't want to gratuitously drop his name. He's, he's the president of one of the major studio pictures. Mm. I, 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 was sp I speak on Tony Robbins' main stage uh, this year at Unleash uh, the Power Within, uh, which is a, an incredible honor for me. And I, it, this guy walked up after and was like, I, I love what you're doing. I, I drink your coffee and, you know, can I send you some stuff? And, and I'm like, okay, but I didn't know who he was. Mm -hmm. And I got a handwritten letter from like this incredibly just, just uh, compassionate, humble, but also very powerful guy right. who took the time to do that. Yes. And like, I'll never forget that. It, yes. was, it was so powerful. And I get right. them from people where, where my work at, in Bulletproof has, has changed their lives where they take the time to write. So I would just offer that to listeners. Um, if you really want to do what Shabir is talking about, you actually do pick up a pen, and if you're gonna you know, plug it into your you know automated you know scam them quick sales software, it just it doesn't work. It, doesn't. it never will. No. Nope. Yeah, I don't know why it doesn't work, but there's a difference. There's a difference. <laughs> Absolutely, there's no doubt about it. Okay. And if you next time you visit in Los Angeles, you let me know. I'd be delighted to meet with you. 
next oh, week. Oh, I would be I would be more than honored. Maybe we can get Jay and the three of us can have lunch. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd be willing to come up. You are still in Vancouver, that, right? You are in Vancouver, right? Yeah, Vancouver Island. Yeah, right, right across from Vancouver. And uh, I come down a lot. We have a coffee shop in LA, and so I'm, right, I'm there right. frequently. And yeah, it would, it would be a great honor to have lunch with you. Um, I'm I, I can tell from reading both the ice cream maker and the difference. Uh, what you're talking about here goes a lot deeper than process management yes. and, and things like that. That that's where that's where you started. Right. But from telling your story and the difference, it's one of the more impactful business books, but also just personal development yes. uh, books that I think people could read. Uh, and the reason it's so impactful is you tell your story and how you got to where you are and the story about your grandfather with a pen and the, that level of resolve and resilience uh, that, frankly, most entrepreneurs could really take a lesson from. Yes. Where like, like you're going to find a way. It doesn't matter if you're not supposed to. It doesn't matter if it's impossible. Like, like that. that's what makes Elon Musk do what Elon Musk does too. Like, I don't care if there's no way. Like, then let's invent one. Right. Right. Yes. And that mindset is very rare and very special, and, and I think you you tell the story in a way that it, it's it's almost uh, it's accessible in a way like Paulo Coelho. Uh, books. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, his, you read him, you're like like there's no sentence longer than five words, <laughs> right. and it's written for like a first grader. But you read right, it, right. And you're like that was cool. But you, you kind of go there on some really tough stuff. So I I admire you know your writing well, and the, you. the topic and just the perspective there. So, thank you so I, much. I think that it's really worth it for if you're listening to the show. Uh, like, <laughs> just trust me, read, uh, read the difference uh, because it will make a difference. Now, I, I have one more question for you. Um, actually, I have two questions for you. Uh, the first one is more self-serving. So you work with these giant multi-billion dollar companies and you coach these big CEOs. Do you work with smaller entrepreneurs as well? Sure, absolutely, yes. You do, yes. absolutely, all right. Yes. So uh, I, I'm not gonna ask you on the air what your price tag is, but maybe I need to spend a couple hours with you. I'm sure there's more I could learn. So sure, I'll, absolutely, I'll yes, yes, there. absolutely, yes. And, and then the other question is, is one that I've asked every guest on more than 420 something episodes now. And it's, if someone came to you tomorrow, Shabir, and they said, look, I wanna be, a better performer. I want to perform better at everything I do as a human being. You know, not just at my work or at my sport or, or whatever, but but all in. What are the three most important pieces of advice you'd have for me? What would you offer them? Um, I think, as you know, I'm very. Um, I try to simplify as much as possible because yeah. that it, then it can be very easily easily can be done. First thing is that I kind of felt the self respect. I think majority of the people. They don't know what, whatever the God is, whatever the superpower is, right? Created us, right? Gives some inside power, each human being. And it can be the mm -hmm. person who can be the homeless person on the street versus right. myself or you or anybody, right? We have that within. So that self-respect part is very important. The question is that if you truly self-respect yourself, then your action will change. But unless you have that self-respect, your action will be shitty because you don't have the yeah. self-respect, right? Then you will lie, you will do this, you will fake, you do this and that. So the real question, and to do that, you have to also kind of, and it sounds a little bit philosophical, but I think a lot of the time, because I'm very lucky, I live very close to Pacific Ocean. So I go in front of the ocean and I try to look at the ocean. I kind of felt, how little I know compared to the ocean. I'm not nothing, nobody, right? So, right. and that, that is the one part. Like, so the first part would be developing that self-respect. The second thing would be, second advice I'm going to give is that you always think, like I always talk about, if, if, this is another example my grandfather taught me, is he used to ask me a question when I was a child, between the numbers zero and nine, what is more powerful? Between the question zero and nine, what is more powerful? And every time I used to say nine, he said, no, zero is more powerful. I said, grandfather, mm -hmm. why? He said, because zero on its own doesn't have any value. Nine on its own has some value. Zero on its own doesn't have any value. But as soon as you put the zero beside a number, it became very powerful. But there is not <laughs> even a single other number you can find which doesn't have any value on its own. So then he told me, you always think in your life you are a zero. I said, Grandpa, what do you mean by that? He said, you are always, one day will come, Shabir, you'll be so successful. But at that time, you always refine, saying that who defined the success? 
those nine other people. He said, if you go to a room, so think about this, Dave. You're sitting in your room and nobody's around you. You're on your own. Are you a successful Dave guy? No. If rest of the, but as soon as you go in front of the other people, they'll say, oh, this is Dave, you know, from Bulletproof. Oh my God. They are the one who's accolade you, give you all the accolade, make you what you are, right? So always think about you yourself is nobody unless another human being. They are the one who is telling, yeah. you are telling me, oh, Shubir wrote this book. Oh, Shubir did this. Oh, Shubir is the world's top management guru. He did this. He consulted all these people. You are the <laughs> one who's giving me the credit, right? But yes. on my own, suppose if I'm on my own in my own room, there's nobody is telling me that. So I'm zero. So without you, without Jay, without Tony, without my clients, I'm nobody. Without my reader, I'm nobody. That is the second thing, right? So the first thing is the self-respect. Second thing you have to think about. Now, you can talk about that is your humbleness or whatever, but this is a much more very easily quantifiable, like zero. I'm zero. I'm nobody, right? And without somebody. So because of that, I have to respect somebody because without them, I cannot become what I became today, right? So that is the second. Right. So that is the second element, I think. The third element, I think, is I kind that is a much more like an actionable item, which is I think every day when you wake up, you're brushing your teeth, you try to ask yourself, what is the one action I can take? One action I can take for another human being who made me to nine or seven from zero, right? So that my self-respect element will also give me more joy. That's those are the three things I, I suggest. That is a that's a powerful list, and it's surprisingly even after hundreds of episodes, that's that's very different than the answers I've heard before. So uh, it it shows your original thinker, and and I am grateful you were on Bulletproof Radio today. Thanks for sharing your wisdom, your knowledge, and all of your books. And for for people listening, like what a what a cool interview. You wouldn't you wouldn't probably have thought from a process management guru <laughs> like that, that. that we'd be talking like about that. that. <laughs> That's why we did this interview. And the book is called The Difference. And I I spend a lot of time reading books, and it helps me to to learn and, and to be a better CEO and just a better person. This is a book that's totally worth your time. And part of that is it doesn't take long to read. It's a short book, but it's full of the good stuff. So I I, I un, unreservedly recommend it. Thank you so much for featuring me. Uh, of course. Uh, have a, an awesome day. And Thank people you. can find out, uh, I suppose I should ask, where can people find out more about your book other than, obviously, if you know the name, you can find it. Is there a URL they should go to? Uh, it will be in Amazon or, or any of the bookstores, you know, is available. Okay, plus, cool. plus is cool. also, if they Google my name, Shubhi Chowdhury, you know, then they will pretty much find it. So, Okay, so you're easy to find yeah, online. No problem. That's great. Yeah, right. Beautiful. Uh, we will have lunch in LA soon. It was an honor to chat with you, thank and you. I look forward to our next conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for preaching me.